This is the Chris DeGall Show podcast. Okay, guys, let's just rip. And Chris DeGall. Chris DeGall. Chris, thanks for being with me tonight. Chris uh, DeGall. I'm joined now by Chris DeGall. Now. He puts the broad in broadband. It's Chris DeGaulle. The Chris DeGaulle Podcast is presented by USMedicalPlan.com. Save big money monthly and get better health coverage at USMedicalPlan.com. I welcome you into the Chris Stigall Show podcast, and uh, thank you so much for your five-star reviews and written reviews of this show. It means more to us than we could possibly say. It also means a lot to me that you call and let John Ruhlman know, the guy that sponsors this show, that uh, not only do you appreciate him underwriting the show to keep our lights on, but I know that you're going to appreciate him once you have a phone call and a conversation about how he can save you on health insurance rates. Folks, this is no time to screw around. In Inflation as it is, the economy as it is, people taking on debt, um, health insurance premiums are hundreds, thousands of dollars a month, I know. And I have had friends that have reached out, made a phone call, and found out that they qualify for thousands of dollars in savings a month. No kidding. I've got a friend. He's family of four. It's him and his wife and uh, two kids. One of the kids has some special health considerations. They needed some additional insurance. And with one phone call, this friend of mine was able to save $2,000 a month. So he was paying this exorbitant sum of money for his daughter. He got better coverage for his daughter. He got better coverage for the rest of his family. And he saved $2,000 a month with a phone call. Now, if you're a small business owner, if you're a retiree on a fixed income and you're paying out the nose for your health insurance premiums, usmedicalplan.com. John Ruhlman awaits your call today. The team at U.S. Medical Plan, 877-410-4321. 877-410-4321. They have a whole customer care department. Um, If you're engrossed right now in some nightmare bureaucratic mess with health insurance and you need an advocate, John and his team at usmedicalplan.com do that too. When you go to the website, look for my smiling face. That's how you know you're on the right spot. But I'm talking about 80 different private insurers John has access to so he can truly shop and compare like nobody I've ever referred to you before. If you buy your own health insurance and you haven't called John and said, can you save me money? Ah, it's killing me. I want you to at least make the phone call. It'll take two minutes. Here's my plan. Here's what I spend. Can you do better? And what if he says yes? And then that means like hundreds, maybe thousands of dollars a month you've saved because you picked up the call, the phone and called. 877-410-4321, usmedicalplan.com. Well, we're not going to get distracted. It is unbelievable what the Biden administration has been involved in. RNC Research has chronicled it all in a tweet. Newly released bank records show Joe Biden received a $40,000 personal check from his brother and sister-in-law in 2017 paid for with laundered money from communist China. So they've uncovered yet another check in addition, remember, to the $200,000 loan repayment. That they, these are all checks. They're, 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 this is, they're moving money around in the hopes that it really won't be followed. This is as old as the day is long. You understand how this works, Fast Eddie. You want to get your dad a fat sum of cash, but you don't want to look like you're directly responsible for it. So you call up uh, your, your cousin Vito and cousin Vito, hey, I'm going to send you a few grand in cash. If, if then you could cut a check to dad for services rendered in the memo line that would be you know one two three move the you just as long the biden's figure as long as they don't have any kind of direct transaction from hunter bagging the cash directly to dad they think we're off the hook jimmy the square job boom bots the bar back they think if if we bag the money send it to jimmy and then his wife cuts joe a check no one will be the wiser is clearly what they've thought about their money laundering operation. So here's what they write. After Hunter's infamous shakedown of his Chinese associate, millions of dollars began flowing from a communist China-affiliated energy company to Hunter's little business that he set up. After a series of complicated financial transactions, presumably to obfuscate the source of funds, tens of thousands of dollars land in the personal bank account of James... And Sarah Biden, you get this. It's easy. It's not hard to follow. 
And then right after that, Sarah Biden, not Jimmy, not Jimmy the square ball, uh, square jaw, but uh, Sarah, the wife, Sarah cuts the check, you know, to make it extra complicated so you and I won't see it. Sarah writes a check to old Joe. It's the second loan repayment from Jimmy the square jaw and his wife, Sarah, to Joe. (laughs) But even if the funds were, in fact, a loan repayment, the money never would have existed in the first place were it not for Biden's years-long, the family's years-long effort to cash in on their family name. It also doesn't explain how the Bidens had $250,000 in cash to loan the family. Again, I go back to this is so crazy blatant. Can we just walk out again? This is a United States senator, all right? Do you remember why Bob Menendez's home was raided? Remember? Oh, yes. Uh, quite well. Yeah, what, what was going on in Bob's house? Uh, well, Bob was getting gifts, uh, cars, gold bars, lots of cash. Yes. Uh, he, he, uh, had, he had hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash and gold bars stuffed in his effing coat pockets. It doesn't get filthier than that. And he says, uh, well, I, I'm Cuban. He says, <laughs> One of my favorite lines ever. Why do you have gold bricks in coats in the closet? Cuban? Well, that explains it then. All right, boys, pack it up. He's Cuban. <laughs> so here's my thing. And this, I, we really have to keep coming back to this. If you don't laugh, you'll get furious at it. Maybe you already are and it's too late. It's so dirty, and it's as though this never even happened. I don't think people really even think anything of this anymore. Hear what I'm saying, just in case you're not following. Joe Biden lends his family 250 cash, just walking around money. I ask everyone in this audience, save the extraordinarily wealthy, who has 250K in cash to lend? Do you think you know anybody? I'm serious. What percentage of the American public do you suppose can openly lend to? I know a couple of really rich guys, like really rich guys, who I think, like, there are there are two men in my phone, all right? I think there are probably two men in my phone that if I called and said, do you have $250,000 in cash to give me, Would could they do it? Could they do it? And I think the answer would be, yes, I could do that. But even they would say, I'm not handing you $250,000 cash. Why? Because people that have that kind of money didn't make it by handing out tens of thousands of dollars in cash to deadbeat relatives. Right? So, in fact, these men that I know drive very old cars. They pay for everything with cash. They're extraordinarily tight-fisted and frugal. So outside of those very wealthy men I know, who can lend, can a United States senator, his entire life he's been a public servant, you really have to let this soak in because I think we talk past this because it's Comer and it's House subcommittees and eh, we eh, whatever, nothing will come of it and we get lost in the details and I don't want to talk about it anymore. Nothing's going to happen. All right, stipulate all that. But let's just pause for a second so that when you're at family dinner this Thanksgiving and it comes up, I want you to say this very succinctly and clearly to everyone's face. And make them explain, how does a United States senator have $250,000 cash to lend his brother? And I want every member of your liberal family to explain to you, how do you suppose it is a man that has served in the United States Senate since he was in his 20s have $250,000 cash to lend to his brother? I want every liberal you know to explain how they could creatively get to that, that finish. What, he's a great investor? What do you think they'd say? What do you think the most clever liberal would say to defend it? Can you imagine? Uh, I can't can't think of it. Have you ever challenged? You know a lot of liberals. I don't waste time with them, but you know a lot of them. Have you ever once said, how does Joe have so much money? Ever asked them that? Uh, I I actually have. Um, What do they say? uh, Honestly, two come to mind, two friends come to mind that say he's 
not a millionaire. Like, it's just like, oh, you look at all the uh, U.S. senators. He's not a millionaire. I'm like, it, well, what? He, he they don't pay- have an answer to that. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he lent, now again, he lends $250,000 in cash to his family as a loan. At the same time, if that's not enough, he bought in cash his Delaware Beach home for $2.75 million cash. So really what we're talking about is Joe Biden in cash lent and spent in one year $3 million cash. 2.75 2.75 to buy a beach home, 250k to give the Jimmy Boombots. And I don't know, look, if there's anyone in this audience who would like to correct me, Lord knows that's been the theme of the week, feel free to let me know how it is that you or anyone you know can just plop 3 grand, 3 million dollars down on the table to buy a home and lend that kind of money. I mean, look, maybe some of you did really well in investments, okay? Maybe you were one of those early Apple investors back in the day, okay? Maybe you have it. Maybe you won the lottery. I'm sure there are extenuating circumstances that there are mem- members of this audience that have that kind of cash. But I don't know too many people who just willfully hand it out. Okay, but nevertheless, that's the... <laughs> I've never seen anything so blatantly dirty in my life. Hunter Biden, the CEO of uh, Filth Inc., running around the globe, collecting all this money, funneling it through family members, ultimately landing in dad's bank account. He's never worked an honest day in his life, and he has all this walking around money to lend to the family and buy beach homes. Sure. Checks, phone calls, houses. Have you ever seen anything so filthy in your life? It's just filth. It's absolute filth. And it's as if it didn't even happen. I don't know. I I just, I refuse to let that go. I just can't let it go. Even though I realize that most of us in this, at this point feel like nothing's going to come of it. The house doesn't have any teeth. Nobody's going to prosecute. Biden won't be punished. I feel it is incumbent upon your host, and I think it is incumbent upon the rest of us who value the truth, to continue to talk about the fact that, yes, Israel is at war with Hamas. And, yes, we have a wide open border. And, yes, there's still rampant inflation. And, yes, there's a lot of crime stories out there. And, yes, the World Series was last night. And, yes, Travis and Taylor annoy you. And, yeah, all the stories, all the things. Look over here. I get it. It's all meant to go, ah, look over here. We cannot lose focus of the fact that we have the most corrupt criminal enterprise the White House has ever seen. And we're acting as though this is normal now. And I can't, every now and again, I have to stop the show and say, yes, I have a thousand bits of news to talk about today. I can't let go that the guy we're pretending is president is just sloshing around in millions of dollars, bagged by his son, clearly, laundered through his family, clearly, with ample evidence to show for it. If we don't continue to prosecute that case, if Republicans don't continue to prosecute that case, yeah, Trump, speaking of, yeah, Trump, court, Trump, did you court, the 91K accounts, Trump, 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 we're trying to get Trump off the ballot in Colorado, insurrection. I mean, hell, they're talking about Tommy Tuberville in the Senate today over on MSNBC. That's their biggest thing. The GOP in the Senate right now, I kid you not, there are members of the Senate GOP who are trying to sandbag Tommy Tuberville. This is some of the supposed opposition party's biggest priority right now. Does that not tell you a lot? about the problem in Washington, D.C. and the Republican Party and what many people call the Uniparty. Republican Senator Dan Sullivan, Alaska, joined by his GOP colleagues Joni Ernst of Iowa, Lindsey Graham of South Carolina, Todd Young of Indiana, and that weaselly little Mitt Romney of Utah. They gathered together in the chamber last night in an attempt to pass 115 top military nominees delayed by Tommy Tuberville. 
Over the course of more than four hours, these Republican senators read out nominees' resumes and argued that Tuberville's uh, hold on them harms military readiness, punishes the officers who are not responsible for the Pentagon's policy, blah, blah, blah. Forcing the Alabama, Alabama Republican to individually object to 61 nominations. Joni Ernst says, that'll be 61 tonight. And Senator Ernst and I, says Dan Sullivan, know that a lot of our other colleagues want to join us. We're going to keep coming down here. My message to our generals and admirals who are being held up, hang in there. Some of us have your back. We have your back. We're coming here every night to try to get you guys confirmed. Aren't they heroes? As you know, Tommy Tuberville has been holding up military promotions since February because of the DOD policy that reimburses, reimburses abortion, which, of course, the CNN people call reproductive care. Yeah, they're just going for a checkup. Tommy Tuberville doesn't want the military reimbursing people who go to the clinic is the way most media will present this to you. Why does that mean Alabama senator not want people to be reimbursed for traveling to out-of-state clinics? There are people in the country that read that story, and that's what they think. And so now you have five Republican senators who have joined forces with the Democrats to sandbag Tommy Tuberville, try to prop themselves up to look good. This is their priority now. Dan Sullivan describes himself, he's the senator, one of the five here the Magnificent Five, describing himself as, as pro-life as they come, and I strongly disagree with the Pentagon policy. But I also firmly believe that one of our most core basic principles, certainly as Republicans, which I think in many ways distinguishes us from our colleagues on the other side, is our serious focus on national security, readiness, and strong military. So Senator Sullivan of Alaska wants you to know that while he's as pro-life as they come, he believes what distinguishes the Republicans from the Democrats is a strong national defense. Fast Eddie, you want to take that one? There's another fat pitch right over the plate. Senator Sullivan wants you to know that incumbent upon him as a Republican is to drive home the point that despite our differences on things like abortion, national security must remain our top Priority is Republicans, which is why Senator Sullivan wants to make sure these military promotions happen, because he supports national security first. So go ahead. I've teed it up. Care to respond to Senator Sullivan? Well, what does abortion have to do with that? Who, who put abortion, the traveling for, paying for abortion into the military in the first place? Question one. Yeah. Uh, here would be my pushback to Senator Sullivan. How are things at the border, Senator? How are things at the border? What have you done to get off your fat ass? You and you lazy ass cologne and cufflink Republicans, what the hell have you done? Tommy Tuberville has done more by himself than you five lethargic, slug, cocktail party Republicans ever dreamt of trying to do. What have any of you done? to strengthen our border? What have any of you done to hold up funding and make a fight and an argument over our border? What have any of you done? What did, these, what did the Magnificent Five do? Have you ever heard these names before? Dan Sullivan, Joni Ernst. Okay, Lindsey Graham, he's in everything. Todd Young and Mitt Romney. Well, he's on the way out the door. I've never even heard of Dan Sullivan, Todd Young, and I know Joni Ernst from Iowa, but that's about it. I've you know, interviewed her a couple of times. Lindsey Graham and Mitt Romney. So these people that you've never heard of and do nothing impressive for the Republican Party, they're not the leaders. I mean, they're not Rand Paul excoriating Dr. Fauci. They're not Ted Cruz or Josh Hawley. They're not people making impassioned cases for the Bill of Rights or the border or a corrupt DHS or Homeland Security or DOJ. Do you hear these names ever? Do you ever hear people? Dan Sullivan of Alaska really thumping his chest. I could have paid you $1,000 today to name one senator from Alaska, and you couldn't have done it today, Fast Eddie. You couldn't have done it. <laughs> Am I right? Well, you might have been uh, able to one. Yeah, one, one for sure, but Dan Sullivan, no, you're right, you're correct. Okay, if I'd asked you who's the other senator than Lisa Murkowski in Alaska, would you have been that able to answer been. it? Yeah. That would have come up zero. <laughs> <laughs> Who the hell is this guy? 
guy. Now he's Mr. Chest Thumper. I'm Dan Sullivan. I got a thing to say about national security. I'm from Alaska. F you. You know what? By the way, your state is plummeting in revenue because the husk doesn't want to drill in your oil-rich state where most of your residents get a cut of the action. Do you know that in Alaska? All of them get a check uh, for oil, res- uh, oil revenue? All of them do. Like, they get an annual check. Good for them. I'm not maligning them. I say, that's great. That's a huge revenue source for his state. What's he done about energy development in Alaska? What's he done to fight it? You ever hear his name? All this green energy crap? Do you ever hear Dan Sullivan's name? Never. Not me. Lindsey Graham goes without saying. Todd Young of Indiana? Ooh, Senator Young and his distinguished record of what exactly? Yep, top of mind when you think opposition party, you think Todd Young of Indiana. Who the hell's this guy? Where's he been? Who is he? Mitt Romney's quitting. Lindsey Graham, much like his sexuality, doesn't know what he thinks any given day, I'm sure. Sorry, was that too far? That's my own surmising. I have no facts to back up what I just said. I'd like to strike that from the record and state publicly that I have no reason to believe that Lindsey Graham is anything but 100% heterosexual. I definitely need a breath freshener. Ooh, but that's going to give me 11 items. That's fine. No, no, no. Rules is rules. Let's see what I'm going to put back. Okay, I need the Reynolds wrap and the bathroom tissue. I could do without the Triscuits, but they sure are good. Sure are good. There he is. That's live footage of Lindsey Graham shopping the other day. Weird that we have that, but we do. Mayors of Chicago, Denver, Houston, L.A., and New York pressing to meet with the husk about getting federal help in managing the surge of migrants, they say, are arriving in their cities with little or no coordination, support, or resources from his administration. Where's Todd Young and Lindsey Graham and Joni Ernst, the lovers of national security? Where are they on this? Have you heard them say anything? I haven't. But Tommy Tuberville is enemy number one because he's holding up promotions in our national security defenses. Mm -hmm. The Democrat leaders of all these cities say in a letter obtained by the Associated Press that while they appreciate Biden's efforts so far, um, sorry, efforts? What efforts exactly? Efforts to keep the border open? While they appreciate his efforts so far, much more needs to be done to ease the burden on their cities. Migrants are sleeping in police station foyers in Chicago. In New York, a cruise ship terminal was turned into a shelter. In Denver, migrants arriving has increased tenfold, and available space to shelter them has withered. With fewer available work authorizations, these migrants cannot find work that will allow them to get into proper housing. Denver Mayor Mike Johnston who is leading the coalition, said nearly every conversation he has had with arriving migrants is the same. Can he help them find a job? Well, I don't know why not. I mean, jobs are so plentiful. The economy is so strong. Isn't that what we hear all the time? Jobs, jobs, jobs. Uh, And Biden's a big jobs creator. And hell, everybody that wants in here can come in. So I should think there'd be a job chicken in every pot, a job for every migrant. We're flush with jobs. The economy's great. Why can't these migrants find work? So these Democrat mayors are going hat in hand, begging Joe Biden to help them because their cities are being overrun. And we have a Republican Party who is going to war with one of their own. Because he opposes Pentagon spending for abortions. We have the most corrupt family the White House has ever seen flagrantly, blatantly washing money right in front of your eyes. $3 $3 million homes, $250,000 checks, right and left. But that Senator Tuberville, by God, if, if there's one thing we're not going to stand, it's one Republican standing on principle uh, stopping the funding of abortion from the Pentagon. We're, we're not going to have that as Republicans, by God. We draw the line there. So, well, so your hero Republican Party, Senators Young and Sullivan from Indiana and Alaska, respectively. 
Excellence in dentistry. That's what you're going to get at Williamsburg Dental. My friend Bob Spinato is back on the phone. He's in Broomall just off the Blue Route. And with two new associates, now you can expand and offer more hours, maybe evening hours, possibly weekends, Bob. Yeah, one of the things that I told them from early on when they started with me was the the value of not only their own time, but other people's times. And they run on a similar schedule that I do. If you've got a one o'clock appointment, you're in their chair at one o'clock. And it's something that across the board at Williamsburg Dental, we really pride ourselves on, whether it's an appointment with the hygienist or whether it's an appointment with one of our doctors. Uh, the other thing is we now have some expanded hours uh, in the evenings, and even even there's some discussion about opening again on some Saturdays for uh, for services. Yeah, so, but not you. You're uh, fishing. You're not kidding anybody. It's not you going to be working on Saturday. Come on, Well, dude. I'm in my 33rd year, and it, it should be the young gun. <laughs> that's, so right. that's right. You've earned it. You've earned it. I feel like I have. Thank you. Pick up the phone or go online, make that appointment, 610-353-2700 or williamsburg-dental.com. This never happens. The man is literally busy doing a live television show as we speak, but was good enough to make time for us to talk about his brand new book, You Know Him Best, from Fox and Friends, a staple on your morning TV for, gosh, I don't know. I'm not, I won't embarrass him by guessing at how long. I'll let him tell us how long, but he's got a brand new book. It's his eighth A Timeless Legacy, Teddy Roosevelt, Booker T. Washington, and the Path to Racial Equality. The author, Fox and Friends' own Brian Kilmeade. Mr. Kilmeade, live on the show this morning. Thanks for being here. Hey, Chris. Thanks so much. Appreciate you having me on. I know you have the you are. Well, no. No, I've just got the one show. You do like eight now and write books. (laughs) Right. Uh, Well, this took three years. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So it, it took a while, but, you know, when we saw the George Floyd things pop up and Kaepernick take a knee, I thought it was important just to give people a perspective on how far we've come as a country and that we're never perfect. I just want to show people that you don't whitewash history, you bring it up, but you also talk about people that brought us through. And I didn't think many people knew about Teddy Roosevelt and Booker T. Washington. And I thought to myself, uh, let me look at up from slavery with Booker T. Washington and all over Teddy Roosevelt. And he salutes him so much for being a member of the Tuskegee board, being somebody that uh, uh, spoke at a commencement address and bringing him to the White House to much controversy and saying, would you be my advisor? Uh, I need to know more about the South. And back then we were still looking very much at a country still trying to heal from the Civil War. Yeah, so they bonded culturally, and as I, I don't have the book with me yet, but I, I'm reading a synopsis of it, and I'm very because I didn't know this story. I'll be very honest with you, I didn't know this story at all. That's why I'm so appreciative you wrote the book. But so maybe culturally they didn't have much in common, but they came together, and you said they shared kind of a a contempt for the culture at that time. Can you explain a little bit about that? Well, look, you'll see some quotes from Teddy Roosevelt, and you'll say, "Wow, this guy wasn't too." You know, there were some things that he obviously was a person of his times. But for the most part, they knew this country had to come together. And they knew that the South and North, you know, they weren't have phone calls and television to bond us. They really felt in many ways like different countries. And how did he get the South vote? Well, his mom was uh, with the Confederacy. His uh, to mom's brothers fought for the South. So he had a sense of what the South, what, what the country needed to come together. And he needed a black leader to work with. And they both needed each other because you had to get funding if you're Booker T. Washington. You had to have credibility. You had to go to the north and say, hey, guys, look what I'm doing with my historically black college of Tuskegee University. I'm raising great kids who are not only learning to read, write, and be scholars, but they all had to learn a trade. So we had to change the way we looked at each other and where blacks and whites would be told something from their parents that the different races had different abilities. He changed it in real time by the thousands. And it started with Tuskegee in a class of 35. And then when I tell you that Booker T. Washington was a slave until he was nine, couldn't read until he was 11, then I go out. This is a story we have to share because we were always ripping this country down. But this guy divided, got up in a country that was very separate but equal in Jim Crow. And he said, I'm going to make it better. And that's why I just thought you need a partner like Andrew Carnegie, uh, J.P. Morgan, the Rosenwald, Prater of Sears, and just to see these guys come together because they knew the country had to come together. I just thought that, you know what, we should get some perspective on where we are as a country. And and the thing that I think makes us great is not that we're perfect, is that we try to be. And we have great people come out of nowhere to lead us. Brian Kilmeade, uh, host of uh, Fox and Friends and his own Brian Kilmeade show, um, 
You see him regularly on Fox Nation as well. This brand new book, it's out on the 7th. It's called Teddy Roosevelt, Booker T. Washington and the Path to Racial Equality, a Timeless Legacy. I, I can't wait to dive into this and learn. I didn't I didn't know about this. I will tell you that my, one of my wife's favorite books, uh, seriously, ever, was George Washington's Secret oh, Six. Okay. She she raves about your book there. I uh, I stumbled on that in 1988. I kept on looking at it and reading it. thought it would be a great movie. When I saw uh, National Treasure with Nicolas Cage, I go, guys, this is a better story and it's real. And they said, well, uh, Brian, it's much easier to sell this story if you write it even if you sell one copy, people like to say based on a book and they like to see it in front of them. I said, all right. Uh, and people, and I just brought, tried to bring new news to it because believe it or not, there's still a lot to be discovered. And when that came out, uh, people really embraced it. And they said things, the smartest people I know said, I had no idea about this. So I just thought, man, what if I find slices of history of revolving around great people that we recognize their names and I, I bring something else out because I can't do what John Meacham uh, what Dave McCullough did and what Douglas Brinkley does by diving in for years to one person. But what if I, what if I just took a slice of their lives? But thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. I really, uh, yeah. I love that book. Still learning about well, that stuff too. The the new one, the brand new one out on the seventh, a timeless legacy, Teddy Roosevelt, Booker T. Washington, the path to racial equality. I know you're on TV and you got to go quickly. Your radio show. How's that going? You like doing it? Yeah, it's fantastic. You know, um, Comes up nine to noon every single day. You know, always had a great roster of guests. And you know the thing about radio. It's not four minutes and out. You don't have to worry about tossing the sound bites. You listen. And things just happen. I love the unscripted nature of it. And Is that weird for you, really- man? I'm sorry to interrupt. May I ask you, you when you go yeah. from TV, have you figured out how to thread the needle going from live television every morning to radio? They are, and they're wildly different. How do you switch your brain? Well, the thing is, is that I really make my own, we make our own choices with this. We have, our producers are great, but they give us frameworks. In TV, they're very specific. And, you know, I have input. But on radio, I really feel like I got more control. I got six minutes, and it, I get it. I just, I'm used to changing speeds. When Tony Snow had the show, and the George Bush said, hey, come to the White House and be press secretary, I was his fill-in, and they said, you have a few hours, can you do it? And I said, yeah, I can get up. You know, I got six minutes to get 15 floors. There's elevators. And that I never thought about it. I never thought about it again. So that's amazing. Uh, and I just, I just, and you know, in our business, this stuff can go away in a minute. There's so many talented people that yes. don't have great jobs like we have. And I not one day do I go and say, okay, let me kick it back and just phone it in. So every day is a challenge. And that's what makes it exciting. And sadly, but we have a war, and no one predicted we'd be talking daily about you know, a war with this type of intensity. It could spiral into World War III, and to be able to talk about it for three hours with the most important people to get a perspective and the players is, is for me, just a dream. And smart people. It, doesn't it help when you know the yeah. audience is smart and they already are well ahead of the game anyway? That, that's my favorite part of uh, the audience that I know you talk to and we talk to. Like People get it. They're paying yeah. attention. Right, and they let me know when they don't think I'm smart, which is always uh, <laughs> so. What I'm I know wrong. you got to yeah. run, Brian. Brian, right. yeah, thank you for doing this while you're live on the show this morning. We really appreciate it. Timeless Legacy: yeah. Teddy Roosevelt, Booker T. Washington, and the Path to Racial Equality. Thank you, Brian Kilmead. Thanks, Chris. I think I'm going to be in Mun uh, Munhall, Pennsylvania, on December 15th. Oh, yeah, okay. so I'm going to be talking about all my books on stage at the Carnegie of Homestead Music Hall. So uh, that'll be on the 15th. If anyone wanted to go to BrianKillMe.com and get tickets, I'll be in Doylestown, too, in Pennsylvania. I'm, I don't really think that's close to you, but the Salem United oh, Church. Oh, yeah. Uh, Doylestown, Doylestown, much Bookstown. closer. So maybe we'll come yeah. visit. That'll be awesome. Thank you. Uh, thanks so thanks, much. Thanks, Brian. Have a great show. You got it. Thank you. You, too. That's Brian Kilmead calling us live this morning from his uh, Fox & Friends set. Fast Eddie. Like I say, booking the show on the fly as the show is happening. There's no quit with you. Well done. Uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that I've ever had a guy call me from his television show set live to promote his book. That's That might be a show first in the 20 plus years we've done this. <laughs> and we, were supposed to, we were supposed to talk with him. At, in full disclosure, we had had a scheduled pre-recorded interview when he's not doing 30 other shows. And uh, we had some technical problems that couldn't allow that. And the guy, to his credit, was nice enough this morning to just dial us up and said, well, hey, I've got a few minutes in between, I don't know what, during commercial break on my cable news morning show, I'll come on and talk about my book then. And we were like, okay, if you think you can, he pulled it off.
But Chris, what, what I appreciate is I always deal with an assistant or an intermediary or somebody, you know, yeah. he actually, yes. we were trying to set it up yesterday. He actually called me and texted me this morning. So it was good. He was being proactive about making sure we made this right. And I appreciate that. I will say about him, whatever you think of Fox generally, when we talk about Fox and I, I have had my fun with Fox, I will say on balance. Brian Kilmeade is one of those guys, when I say there are a lot of good people at Fox, I, I think gener genuinely he is one of the good people. He is he works very hard, and he's, a, as you heard, like he's very conscientious. He doesn't, he didn't have to call the show today. You'd never have known we didn't connect with him yesterday, and I would have never said, but he felt bad that we couldn't make it work yesterday, and so decided to interrupt the middle of his work day to call us up. I, I think that's classy. That's indicative of character, don't you think? Uh, it's, it's uh, Chris, you know the people that I deal with on a daily basis? <laughs> Let's I, just say I, there are other, the, the other side of this is uh, somebody calling and berating Eddie because the, the, we had technical problems and we refuse to ever come on the show again. I'm of two minds about this uh, George Santos thing. And I suppose Rashida Tlaib to a degree what is the party's response to people like these versus what is their voters' response to people like these? Um, I'll ask it another way. Do you want the Republican body, the House Republicans, do you want them responsible for admonishing the behavior of a certain representative, or do you think it's more the responsibility of their voters back home to see to it that they don't get reelected? For instance, um, should the Republican Party... Because um, I really want to be consistent and fair here, even though I know Democrats are not. For a minute, I, I have to kind of think about this. And as I'm honest about it, <clears throat> Lauren Boebert got in trouble um, massaging her boyfriend's Boebert during a, um, they were caught on camera during a play or something back in her home district. Um, and... I, I, what I still love about this story to this day is she had no idea who the guy was, and that was date number one. I guess I need to be more selective in who I choose for dates in the future. Found that he was a progressive donor or something, I guess. I don't know. But that's what she says later. I guess I need to know a little bit more about who I'm dating. I, I mean, fellas, if you're single, I guess that's... Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know many guys that... Um, have successful first dates quite like he was having. I'll just put it to you that way. But setting all that aside, um, vaping and kind of being obnoxious at the theater, granted, stipulated, whatever. And what did I say at the time? I said, look, whatever. Like, is, she, is that behavior my cup of tea? She votes the way I want. So selfishly, you know, she's not my congressperson. Uh, she votes the way I want, whatever. Her constituents will deal with her. And conventional wisdom holds that she won by a thread, and so probably out there in Colorado, they're going to toss her out next year, right? So with George Santos, this weirdo in New York who lied about a lot of things and won an election, what's the Republicans' responsibility to deal with him, Fast Eddie? Do you think uh, they I mean, should I mean, be the ones to throw him out? No, hell no. First of all, I don't Absolutely think they can. Not. I don't think you can literally do that. But censure him? Punish him? No, <laughs> because I mean, if, if you do, then you would have to, maybe you, I mean, what are we talking about? But then I have to extend this out. If I'm going to be consistent, I got to extend this out to Rashida Tlaib. All right. So she's a bigot. Is it the body's responsibility to censure bigotry? I mean, they wouldn't listen. They wouldn't wait for a second and they don't. They impeached a president twice. The Democrats did. So I don't want to give them any credit. They don't miss an opportunity to make a public spectacle of Republicans when they're in charge. This is the problem with being a constitutional conservative is you have to be intellectually consistent and you have to say, well, listen, this is a representative republic. Each one of these people represents their home district and they have to answer to their constituents. Is it the rest of the 434 members voted on by other people from around the country, is it their responsibility to punish my member of Congress? Unless he or she does something illegal, literally criminal, if they're just obnoxious or caught being overtly sexual in their spare time or even lying, is it the House body, the representative body's responsibility to punish them and expel them? 
That's the question I've been asking myself today. No. <laughs> I don't think so either. No. I, 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 I come back to probably not. Probably not. Now, again, I know the Democrats wouldn't miss a minute. They wouldn't miss an opportunity like this. Um, but it explains, you know, for people that you know, all the headlines today that say they didn't expel John uh, or they didn't punish Santos and they didn't punish Tlaib and here are the Republicans who didn't punish her. I think Chip Roy was one of them who didn't. Let me see if I get up. One of the House um, Freedom Caucus guys it says Representative Roy. I think that's him. So anyway, it was a censure. I mean, the thing is, I, you can censure somebody for anything, I suppose. It's just an interesting discussion. Santos and Tlaib on the same day. Uh, neither one were dealt with yesterday. Most of the House, I think, still feels like that could be me next. You know, I think that's probably what they're all thinking. If we do this to one of us, we could potentially be doing it to all of us. I think. Can't be sure about that, but just uh, asking myself that out loud. Interesting comments from this loathsome former attorney general who was largely responsible for what we're watching today, the weaponization of the DOJ. Um, paying close attention to, we don't hear much from this guy. You remember well, he was the guy that said, hey, I know Michelle Obama says when uh, they go low, we go high. Eric Holder, the former attorney general of Barack Obama, his wingman, if you remember, Eric Holder referred to Barack Obama, he was his wingman. So not at all separate. You know, most presidents have gone out of their way to say, hey, attorney general, he does what he does. I don't talk with him. He makes the decisions, whatever. We don't talk. Not Eric Holder. He was very proud and happy to say, hey, Obama and I, we're like this every day, all the way. I'm his wingman. Whatever he wants, I got his back. What we're living and watching, the radicalization, Merrick Garland, the, the harassment of average Americans, th this is all Eric Holder. It's the Obama administration. This is governed, that stupid old man and his little tiny diminutive bowling alley waitress attorney general, they're not doing anything. This is the radical, aggressive agenda of Barack Obama and Eric Holder telling these stupid old whiteies what they're going to do. That's what it is. That's what we're living, just so you understand. So curious, publicly, when Eric Holder surfaces, it's not often, he was inside Jen Psaki and uh, had this to say. Do you think looking at this, Judge Chutkin reinstated the gag order after she uh, put a pause on it. It's still under appeal. Are you confident or do you feel comfortable with her legal justification for reinstating it? Yeah, I certainly think there's a, a basis for her concern. I think there's a basis for the order that she has, uh, in fact, put in place. My expectation would be that the appellate court will, in fact, uphold that which she has um, tried to restrain the former president from doing. It's a pretty limited order. Mm -hmm. um, it does not say that you can't say anything. It says you can only say you can't say negative things about a relatively small <laughs> universe of, of people. You can even comment on the case. Um, but... I think, as you said in, in Leiden, uh, I think he's likely to go beyond that, which um, even she says in that limited order. And we're going to have some ultimate questions that I think are going to have to be determined. Um, would a judge actually do that, which would happen to a normal person and yeah. put somebody in jail for violating uh, a, an order, not to uh, a, a, a gag order? Uh, I suspect that's not likely to happen um, with this defendant, but any other defendant uh, would probably be facing... You don't think that she would put him in jail or that they would decide to put him in jail ultimately? I, I, I just don't think so. I mean, I, I think there are a number of things you put monetary fines on him, as the judge did um, in New York, uh, perhaps restrict his ability to use truth social. Um, you know, I don't, a number of things. I try to be as creative as possible if I were the judge. But I'd be extremely reluctant to take um, a person who's a former president, the leading candidate um, of one of our major parties, and, and actually put him in jail. Because you'd be worried about the political consequences or the reaction in the country? Yeah, I mean, this is already a pretty divided nation. And to uh, do something like that, to take somebody off the campaign trail, uh, to put him in jail, uh, I, I just would be very reluctant, uh, really reluctant to do that. Yeah, he'd be very, very reluctant. He strongly disagrees with the idea. So he's basically daring Trump 
to violate Shaka Khan's gag order here. I, it sounds to me, I think he's almost goading. I, I serious. This is the kind, this is the way I think they think. So Eric Holder says, "Listen, this is a very limited gag order." He basically is telling she's t- she's telling Trump not to run around mouthing off about her and the people who work for the court. Um, so as long as he does that, he can pretty much say anything else he wants. But if he, if he mouths up about her, well, he could be in violation of that gag order. And then she could throw him in jail if she wanted, you know. And Jen Psaki excitedly, oh, 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 you think she will? Because he's going to talk bad about her. Do you think he'll, she'll throw him in jail when he talks bad about her? Do you? Do you? Says inside Jen Psaki. Eric Holder, oh, now Jen, no, 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 no. Then he becomes Mr. Uh, slow and Steady. Let's, let's calm ourselves. Our fevered passions in the country. Yes, Mr. Reasonable, Eric Holder. When they go low, we kick them. Uh, I, this is already a very divided country, Jen. I, I would hate to see. I don't think it would be good if we threw Trump in jail for violating. I mean, the judge certainly could, if, but I don't think she should. That would be a... <laughs> Where's Eric Holder been throughout all of this? If, if that's truly his argument, which of course it's not, if that were truly his argument, none of these federal charges should be brought. He made the case, and it is true, but he doesn't mean any of this. Trump is, of course, the leading Republican candidate. Trump is the, the Republican's choice by a lot. If you believe polls, we'll see when the primary is over, but right now, most of us based on what it appears, the evidence before us, Trump's going to be the nominee. It is factually true and correct. This is the thing that I've pointed out before, Andrew C. McCarthy, our former (laughs) guest on Trump Matters, who who now thinks Trump should go to prison, I think. Um, And that's fine. That's his prerogative. God bless him. I still consider him a friend. We just don't see eye to eye on this. Uh, But this is the kind of thing that Andy used to say. And it was of great frustration to many in this audience because I'd get the nasty grams when he would say, listen, sometimes the law doesn't have a place in situations like this. Sometimes there's not a clear violation of any law. It's just the spirit of the thing or the nature of the thing, or it's just kind of, as he would used to say, icky. You look at something and you say, well, it's not a violation of the law. It's just kind of icky. It's gray. It's questionable. And as such, Andy used to say, We don't have to throw everybody in prison. We don't have to go through lengthy, expensive court battles. Sometimes elections solve these things. The ultimate justice is the election process. And if the voters decide that what they're seeing is icky enough, they'll throw the guy out or they won't reelect the guy. Eric Holder seems to be saying that on the surface, but it's total lies. Eric Holder doesn't mean a word of this. He's trying to come off as Mr. Reasonable. Oh, I don't. If if he violated the gag order, I don't think she should throw him in jail. No. Or too polarizing. The country's already so deeply divided. What's his name? Jack Smith should never have brought a single charge against Donald Trump if that's your working calculation. Your working calculation should be exactly what Andy McCarthy's is. There's nothing law-breaking here. There was no law broken. Everybody understands that's fair-minded. This isn't about violating the law. This is about persecuting a political enemy. These cases are political. They're not about law-breaking. It's political persecution. He knows it. Merrick Garland knows it. Most of the country who's objective and fair-minded knows it, even if you don't like Trump. Even people who are pro-DeSantis or Haley or other Republicans know, they know, Donald Trump didn't break laws. We all understand that. He was the former president of the United States. It's as stupid as this Manhattan trial. He inflated the value of his... He paid back every dollar with interest of every loan he took out. The people he took the loans from didn't file suit. The people he took the loans from never claimed they were defrauded. The attorney general of New York is, a, uh, is asserting he defrauded the lending institution, Not it, which, again, ridiculous. Now they're trying to set the terms of his property values. Documents, possession of documents, questioning elections. He was the former president of the United States. Possession of classified documents, questioning the election, is not illegal. It is not outside the purview of the presidency. Very little is. In fact, to my knowledge, there's almost nothing 
that's outside the purview of the presidency. It's a powerful job for a reason. So if Eric Holder really meant it, what he would say inside Jen Psaki is we're coming up on a major political election and the, the American people are going to have their say once and for all what they think of Donald Trump. And with confidence, Eric Holder should say, oh, I think he's done a lot of scummy things or icky things or gray things or whatever. But if he really meant it, he doesn't mean what he said. He's right on the surface, but this isn't real. He's not sincere. He's goading. He's basically, he thinks this uh, Shaka Khan judge is probably going to throw him in jail. And Jen Psaki was so excited that she, I mean, it was like Santa's coming early. Oh, do you think she could throw him in jail right away? Maybe like, like, like before Christmas, maybe? Trump in jail for Christmas? Oh, I don't know, Jen. I'd, uh, I'm going to pretend to be really restrained and not laughing hysterically under this pancake makeup. Uh, no, I, oh, no, that would be a tip. <laughs> I'll bet they'll try. I'll bet they try. Don't be surprised when they try. Don't be surprised when a judge ultimately says, I'm sending you to jail for violating something before these trials even finish. Yeah, that would be a terrible mistake. Very divisive in these times. They wouldn't mind a full-blown civil war if that's what it took. They want January 6th on steroids, folks. That's what Eric Holder wants. That's why he's consistently, with Merrick Garland, been poking you in the chest, raiding people's homes, calling you a terrorist for showing up at school board meetings, threatening you with the IRS. This left-wing government is taunting you actively every day. They know exactly what they're doing. They are creating the simmering tension with a law-abiding, Bill of Rights, Constitution-loving American public who voted Trump and who doesn't support them. They are picking a quiet fight with all of us. They are slowly tormenting and agitating the rest of us in the hopes that eventually their big crescendo may well be jailing him. And if it meant that this country descended, and I'm serious, if it meant this country descended into a full-blown civil war, it would delight them because it would finally give them justification to lower the hammer on you once and for all and quite literally round us all up because we're a danger. Now the whole country's insurrectionists. We're basically the South during the Civil War. We're the Confederacy at that point. I know you think it may sound a little exaggerative or crazy, but I know a lot of you also understand that we're careening there quickly. He doesn't mean it. If he meant it, if, if good people of good faith meant it, they'd say, our political process is enough. Let's make sure our elections are clean and clear and transparent. And let's let the American people make decisions about who should lead. Let's give them all the facts and all the information. And let's let the chips fall where they may. And if the American people think Donald Trump should be president again, then fine. And if they decide based on everything that we've presented that he shouldn't be president anymore, fine. We don't have to go through courts of law. We don't need to involve federal grand juries and judges and threats of gag orders. I wish that Eric Holder meant what he just said. He doesn't mean it. He's caused all of this. He wants this consternation. And he shows up once every six months on a cable news show and acts like Mr. Reasonable. I don't buy it for a second. Demonstrate issues are what matter. Issues are what winning the day looks like. Issues are what caused citizens of New Jersey and Republicans to win against wind farms that they didn't want. It's issues. Joe Biden's corruption is an issue. It needs to be addressed. War. Why it's happening. It's an issue. The weakness, the fecklessness of this administration that's an issue. The wide open border is an issue. Crime in our cities is an issue. And as long as we stick to issues, there should be no trouble in prosecuting Democrats come election time. But if we allow ourselves to get distracted with nonsense, um, like trying to throw Trump off the ballot in Colorado, which is absurd on its face, uh, I know Christina Bob agrees. She's a Trump attorney. She has authored a book, uh, an important book that really chronicles all you need to know about the 2020 election. Stealing Your Vote is her book. Stealing Your Vote, the ins uh, inside story of the 2020 election and what it means for 2024. I welcome you back, Christina. If, if the election's about issues, 
it's not even close. If it's about a bunch of nonsense that Democrats distract us with, different story. Good morning. Good morning. You're exactly right. Uh, Republicans win every single issue hands down. The problem is Democrats don't focus on the issues. They focus on rigging and stealing elections and controlling the media, uh, trying to lead us all to believe that we're the minority. (laughs) We are not. Uh, Most Americans love this country and want to see it thrive. And uh, yeah, I think you're right. We win on the issues. Donald Trump's eldest son, co-chief of his business empire, Donald Trump Jr., this from Politico, denied in court Wednesday he was involved in preparing financial documents exaggerating his father's net worth. This is just an attempt to drag uh, Trump's family through this along with him. They're going to try to rope everybody they can into this. Uh, It's been well established and documented. No no one that lent money to Donald Trump for business purposes is, is alleging any crime. True? That's exactly right. Yeah. And so yeah, you're, yeah. you're right. This is. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, please continue on. You're right. They, they have been unable to deter Donald Trump from dropping out of the race, from not entering the race, from slinking away quietly into the night. And so now they're trying to hurt his family, hoping that that will slow him down or get him, you know, to to drop out of the race. It won't. It's not going to deter him. It's not going to deter the family. They're in this together as a family. They're all committed to saving this country. And we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars in loans. I mean, who doesn't use an accountant? I use an accountant for my house and for my own personal taxes. If you're going to be securing a loan, you're certainly going to be relying on professionals. And in reality, the professionals were accurate. And to be fair, the professionals at the banks actually valued the properties higher than those at the Trump organization. So there's no no reason to believe that there was any fraud committed here. This seems, and it appears to me, to be political theater at its finest. Christina, your legal hat on here down in Georgia for a minute. It's funny because, you know, these things all bubble up. It's like there's four or five pots sort of simmering, and then right. one will sort of boil over for a little bit, and it distracts everybody from the others. And then that'll kind of die down, and another pot will start to boil over. So... We're talking about multiple yeah. venues and distractions here, obviously. But for a while, the, the, the story was Trump associates flipping down there in Georgia. Um, right. Do you care to define that for us as someone who has counseled the president legally? Uh, what, what's gone on in Georgia, in your view, with the f- people that are, quote, flipping? Well, from my perspective, I don't think they're flipping. I, I think that they're cutting deals for themselves to get out. I mean, I don't know. It's going to, well, you know, we'll find out when their testimony comes, but I don't think any of them have any evidence whatsoever that could potentially incriminate the president. Um, And I think it also goes to show, you know, Fannie Willis brought this really outrageous, egregious RICO charge claiming, Oh, this is organized crime. It's, you know, so terrible. They tried to overthrow our government and the people who are pleading are getting probation. So (laughs) how bad is this? Is this actually truly a threat to our democracy or is this a pawn that you're using, a tool that you're using to try to take out your political opponent? It appears to be the latter because they don't actually have any problems with anybody who are willing to say, oh, you know, I lied or, you know, try to um, take a, a lesser deal just so that they don't have to be put through the trauma of experiencing a trial. But there's no threat here. So said another way, if I'm some low-level employee of a company and the boss has been working with me to skim a bunch of money, prosecution says, hey, we know you've been part of skimming money from the company and feeding it to the boss, but you, you give up what you've been doing for the boss. Uh, that doesn't mean that I get to walk away. I was still involved in committing Correct. a crime, right? Yeah, though you'll still have to be punished for whatever you did. And the fact that the punishments here are, quote unquote, punishments are so light, it's because they didn't actually commit crimes. There's right. no egregious crime to, to punish. I just want everybody to understand that because I think sometimes um, it's easy to start feeling like, uh oh, you know, the, the media so hammers this yeah. notion that everyone is now turning their back on Trump or something when in fact, You've, you've described it well. So using Georgia now as the basis of uh, insurrection and trying to overturn an election, that's exactly what they're alleging 
in Colorado and why Trump should be completely taken off the ballot in Colorado. This is one of the stupidest of all of them. And I suspect if it has any legs, it will be overturned quickly on appeal. But uh, do you think it's going to make it out of Colorado? Um, I don't know. The judge has donated to radical leftist organizations with the intent of removing Republicans from office. She was the one that revealed that from the bench herself. Uh, she also claims she has no recollection of doing it, which is, uh, you know, I'm sure she buys that whenever witnesses in her court say that. Oh, I have no recollection of committing the crime, and I'm sure it's perfectly fine. Um, but so I don't know. To me, it's, I, I, there's no I don't foresee this going anywhere as far as Trump. Trump will be on the ballot in Colorado. Yeah. He'll be on the ballot in all 50 states. I don't actually think that that's a true threat. I think. Um, if they are successful at getting this judge to side with them, to go along with this chicanery, um, like you said, it will get overturned. I suspect it will probably go up to the Supreme Court because I imagine other states will be like, oh, Colorado did it, you know, and California will jump on board and all these crazies will do it. Um, so I think it'll I think it probably will end up at the Supreme Court. But I, there's no semblance of legality for doing it. Not only does the 14th Amendment not apply, it doesn't apply because insurrection is what you would be required to prove in order to take him off the ballot using the 14th amendment. He's not even charged with insurrection. It's not on, it's not on any of his indictments. So they're basically declaring him guilty of a crime. He hasn't even been charged with, let alone convicted. So, um, I, I, I just don't see how it can if, be upheld it, anywhere. It, Democrats want him in jail. That, that's, we, we understand that they, they want the physical yeah. picture of Donald Trump being booked and sent in. You know, they want a frog march. They want right. him in the or jumpsuit. We all understand that. Which one do you think they're banking on as being the one most successful? Is it Fannie Willis down there in Georgia? Oh, Washington, D.C. Washington. No, okay. no, no. Okay. I don't think he stands. I don't think they stand a chance in Georgia. Um, I I think they're they, I, in Washington. The only reason I say Washington, D.C. is because they've got a judge who's sided with them pretty much 100 percent of the time on everything they've asked for. Just yesterday, she came out with an order. Um, the government filed a motion under seal, meaning the defense was not allowed to see it, about classified information that's pertinent to the January 6th case that they don't want to show the defense. And of course, the defense responded and said, hey, we need to have an opportunity to see the motion. We need to have an opportunity to see the evidence that they claim is relevant to this case. And the judge not only ruled that they're not allowed to see the evidence, she also ruled that they're not allowed to even see the motion that was filed. <laughs> so this is pretty extreme, in my opinion. It, it's, I mean, they're not allowing the defense to even see the evidence that the government has that's related to the case. So, and I, I don't know, obviously I haven't seen it, but I would imagine that it exonerates the president because if it didn't, it would already be all over the front page of, you know, the New York Times or whatever. But they're, they're claiming it's classified information, it's sensitive, it's a matter of national security, so we can't show the defense. And the court sided with them. So, Chris, yeah. Um, uh, Christina Bob is a, a former Trump attorney uh, and author of a, a really important book called Stealing Your Vote, The Inside Story of the 2020 Election, What It Means for 2024. Almost nothing. You hear almost nothing out of the Mar-a-Lago documents case, which was the one to me that was the most, uh, uh, probably of everything we have seen in the last couple of years, and this is a tall order to say this, Mm -hmm. I would submit a former president's home being raided by the current president's DOJ (laughs) is the most egregious, obscene thing I've ever seen. I I don't know if there's something worse. Maybe you disagree. No, I don't. I think you're completely right. I was there. And, and I still work for the president, by the way. I'm not a former attorney. Oh, I'm sorry. My, my apologies. Um, okay. No, that's okay. Okay. Um, but no, I was, I was there when they raided it. And I think you're exactly right. And quite honestly, I, I think that they did not anticipate the terrible backlash that they would get for that. I also think it's possible that they thought they could get a rate. I honestly believe it's possible they may have thought that they could get away with raiding his home without anybody finding out. Yeah. Unfortunately for them, President Trump announced it <laughs> and it, it became a thing and they got they had very serious backlash. So to your point, I think I think they're trying to kind of push that one to the side for a number of reasons. One, Joe Biden has done far worse than Donald Trump has. And we're all aware of that at this point when it comes to keeping classified records. So it's a very, very bad case for the government. I wouldn't be surprised if they secretly regret bringing it, but they brought it. So here we are. So 
you know, they're downplaying it and they're going with this other stuff. So now. what you're saying to me is, I think I'm hearing you say, they're ultimately just going to come back home to the same old tired horse they've been de- beating dead, insurrection, yeah. January 6th. Yes. Yeah. And I think that that's what they're hoping to hang their hat on because it's in Washington, D.C. So they have a more favorable jury pool. Uh, You know, the judge has been ruling in their favor on a lot of this stuff. She's been the most aggressive judge as to all of the other January 6th defendants. You know, luck of the draw. They got the most aggressive judge. Um, So I think that's the one that they're just hanging their hat on, hoping that they can get a conviction there. Christina, Bob, Trump attorney. And to be clear, I don't I don't think they will just to calm everyone through it. I don't think that they will get a conviction anywhere, but um, that's what they're hoping And, and because, do you, do you think, I mean, what's the most optimistic outcome in Washington, D.C., that a jury of his peers is is a hung jury? I, I mean, because, you know, I've, I've talked with some who think it's, you can't possibly get a fair jury in Washington, D.C., and there are right. a lot of people that are very fatalist about it, but you think, what, maybe there might be one or two who have a, a conscience and say this isn't right? Sure. Well, I think... <laughs> I mean, certainly a hung jury, I think, is probably the most probable. Yeah. Um, but I think all outcomes are in play in D.C. I even I would not even be surprised uh, with an acquittal. And I'm probably the only attorney that will say that because everyone's looking at it going to Washington, D.C. Yeah. Um, but we have to remember, he's not actually guilty. He didn't right. do what they're accusing him of. And so and for me, an acquittal is still on on the table. Um, but certainly it's all on the table. We'll we'll see how it plays out. We have a new Speaker of the House, and it was so interesting to me that one of the things they said about Mike Johnson is he voted against certifying the 2020 election as if that made him disqualified to be Speaker of the House. So what what of that? Like, let's just go back. I mean, you wrote the book, Stealing Your Vote. If you think that's where this is going, and I tend to agree with you, it's all going to come down to, you know, the stupid commission and Liz Cheney and all they've done for the last four years is try to convince the American public that Donald Trump tried to overthrow the election of 2020. So you've written the book on it. Um, Where do you think the American people are with it? How do you see it? I mean, have they effectively convinced too many people that Trump did something wrong and illegal and trying to overturn an election? Do you think that worked? Is it working? No, I think it worked initially. I think people were concerned about it. But now that they've been beating that dead horse because of the point you made earlier, they don't have issues. Right. They don't they can't win on the issues. So they have to help with something else. So they have this boogeyman in the closet saying Donald Trump tried to overthrow the government that, oh, by the way, he was in charge of that day. So that's an interesting tactic. (laughs) Um, But they they go back to the one thing that I don't even want to say they have it. I don't even think they have it anymore. But the one thing that they hang their hat on is he tried to overthrow the United States government. He's a threat to democracy. Okay, no one believes it anymore. I mean, they just elected Mike Johnson, Speaker of the House, meaning there's enough members of Congress who aren't concerned about their constituents holding them accountable for that. So I, I, they, don't, they don't have anything else. They don't have the issues. They don't have anything on Donald Trump. Uh, you know, whether they want to use these procedural kind of gamesmanships like they're doing in New York where they're going to fine him or, you know, try to say that he did something wrong that no one else believed even occurred. Um, they, they might be able to do that. But when it comes to getting a unanimous conviction on something as serious as trying to overthrow the United States government, and, and to be fair, that's not even one of the allegations. It's just defrauding Congress. Yeah. So basically his conversations with Mike Pence saying, hey, send it back to the states. That was ultimately the decision that they had made was that send it back to the states, allow the states to reconsider. They've asked for more time. Let's give it to him. Um, apparently that Mike Pence, which he may be proving this to be true, but Mike Pence is so fragile that making that suggestion was somehow improper. That's effectively what what they've charged, is that even having that discussion with members of Congress, whose responsibility it is to hash out these issues for the American people, even raising that with them was somehow uh you know, defrauding the government. Yeah, and that conceptually somehow all of a sudden Congress has no say cannot exert itself in any way, cannot insert right. itself in a discussion about certification of an election. I, I mean, we were structured that way. Like, they certainly that are entitled Congress. to. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, um, Right? Yeah, they're, yeah, they're bringing up these ridiculous issues themselves, which they'll reverse themselves on as soon as they need their power back. Well, that's right. Uh, Mike Pence says, I'm done, I'm not running. Um, he never, ever got any traction. Is it over this issue? I, I, like, I don't know how, in his, how do you judge 
How do you think Mike Pence will be judged uh, historically and in his role in I think that he'll go down event? as the I think he'll go down as the the greatest Republican traitor of our time. I really do. Um, I can't. I was going to say the greatest American traitor, but that's not true. I think that will, that honor will go to Joe Biden. But um, <laughs> I, I think Mike Pence will get worse and worse over time as far as his reputation goes. As this starts to, as the layers to this start being pulled back and as President Trump makes it through these cases, I mean, it all hinges. And that's why you've got Republicans happy to see Donald Trump going through what he's going through. That's why we have Republicans still in the presidential race, because they're hoping that the swamp takes Donald Trump out, which I think is the most disgusting thing. This is not a Republican versus Democrat thing. This is a swamp versus the American people thing. And you have a lot of Republicans that want to see Donald Trump taken out because it helps them and it helps their career. And that was the game that Mike Pence was playing back in 2020. He was trying to manage his career and not manage the country. And uh, I think as, as this unfolds, it, it, it's all going to get revealed and it, it'll, it'll probably take several years for all of it to come out, but it, certainly by July of 2024, we'll have, we'll have the 90% solution. But, La- um, yeah. Last, yeah. I think, I think it's all going to get revealed. My last question for you is Eric Holder was on the Jen Psaki program and uh, he doesn't, he doesn't make mm-hmm. uh, many public visits uh, anywhere. I think he's largely driving this DOJ. So is Barack Obama in this administration. I, I, the, the the behavior of this government is them all over, is it not? And so he's he's on TV looking like Mr. Reasonable yeah. and Mr. Moderate. And Jen Psaki very hopefully asks, I won't play it all because of time, but she very hopefully asks, well, if he, if Trump runs around and he mouths off and, and violates this gag order, you, you think she'll throw him in jail? I mean, she's so excited that maybe <laughs> the judge will throw him in jail and, and then hold her. Mr. Right. Reasonable comes in and goes, oh, I... I think that would be a very bad idea for her to actually throw him in jail. I don't. I don't think you know. <laughs> yeah, we've got no Yeah. I, so I just think that's funny that Holder is acting like Mister Reasonable. That even if he did violate her gag order, she wouldn't throw him in jail. What of that? What of him saying that? He's right. I mean, she's not going to throw him in jail. You not for violating a gag order anyway. I think either either of the judges that have put gag orders on him would be in. Insane, absolutely insane to throw a presidential candidate, the most popular presidential candidate in jail for speaking. I mean, that's the most un-American thing you can do. And I think they realize not just the the physical problems that that could create in the United States, but that would hand him the election. I mean, do they single handedly want to get him elected president? Because if they did that, they would. So, I no, I don't think that's on the table. I mean... Do you, was that so? Only, how do you take Eric Holder saying that they don't? They never say things like that that would benefit Trump. So it strikes me as interesting that he did. I, I don't trust him. So why would he say something like that to no. warn the judge? No, I think. Well, maybe that's a good point. Um, I I honestly think the only people who think there is a chance of Donald Trump going to jail are certifiably insane. <laughs> I mean, it it is so far beyond the scope of reality that even Eric Holder is like, now, Jen, you're being silly. I mean, you could be right. Maybe they are, you know, like dog whistling or whatever, sending each other signals. But I don't even I honestly think you have to be absolutely out of your mind to think any judge, no matter how crazy you want to believe the judges would put Donald Trump into jail for violating a gag order. That's just not in the realm of possibility. Christina Bob represents uh, Team Trump as an attorney. She is uh, author of a very important book called Stealing Your Vote, the inside story of the 2020 election and what it means for 2024. You can follow her on X at Christina underscore Bob with two B's, B-O-B-B, Christina underscore Bob. It's a pleasure to catch up with you. I hope we can continue to stay in touch as all of this uh, mess unfolds. There have been some listeners to this podcast for a while that uh, are are great supporters and uh, friends, and now they've decided to jump in and become sponsors. I'm proud to have them aboard. Uh, They're guys that operate a website called gulagamerica.com. They try to have a little fun and a little irreverence with the very real state of affairs we find ourselves in these days. In fact, regularly when I post something on social media, you'll see them come in and they'll say something like, that's Gulag America. Well, that's a brand name. That's actually what they've been trying to frame so much of what we're living through, what they call Gulag America. They've been great supporters of the Harumph Society as well, founders as a matter of fact. I'm so pleased and proud to have them as sponsors. Gulagamerica.com. 
Go to their website, your online home for what they call apparel with attitude. I think you're going to dig it. If you're unhappy with the direction the country is headed, I think that speaks for itself for most of this audience. If you're dismayed that three quarters of Democrats and half of Republicans want the government to restrict hate speech, potentially meaning shows like this one, podcasts like this one, um, that's Gulag America. Go to gulagamerica.com. They're the shop for you. They have everything from American classics like Gadsden flag shirts that say don't tread on me to original designs ripped from the headlines, like the recent edition that reads, Mask me once, shame on you. Mask me twice, shame on me. Pretty good. That and so many more. Great shirts, great apparel. Gulagamerica.com. Great supporters of this show. Great American patriots and friends and founding members of the Harumph Society. Honored to have them aboard. Gulagamerica.com. As they say, Gulag America, it's not our wish. It's our warning. Gulagamerica.com. Welcome aboard, fellas. I met this lady in the Commonwealth of Virginia, in fact, last year, talking about school choice. She's been a huge school choice advocate, and uh, I think probably one of the big reasons the conversa conversation shifted so hard in Virginia. Uh, but she has written a book uh, kind of more broadly discussing uh, the themes that she was advocating in the school choice fight, but now broadly to the culture, called Mao's America, A Survivor's Warning. G. Van Fleet is her name and joins us now. Great to have you this morning. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, may I ask you first, G, your interest in the school choice fight before you wrote this book? Can you talk about why you got so involved there? Yeah, actually, it's 2021. It's a... Uh, it's almost three years ago that I went to the uh, Loudoun County School Board. And uh, what I'm passionate about this issue is I am a victim of indoctrination in the government school in cities, China. I grew up in Mouse, China, and I spent my entire school years, 10 years of my schooling uh, was spent in the Cultural Revolution. And it was... Uh, the uh, the most radical form of indoctrination, and I see the same thing happen here, and that's why I'm so passionate about it. I don't want our kids turned into the Chinese red guards, but many of them have already been down. The brainwash has been done, but we have to stop it, and we have to save those who have been brainwashed. You have a very unique perspective, and if I could bring it into a modern-day discussion, that is uh, what we see right now with Hamas and Israel. Do, do, are you struck yeah. by the number of young people in this country? I just read a survey yesterday that said a third of young young voters, 18 to 34 years of age, a third of them don't even believe that Hamas attacked Israel. They don't even believe it happened. Does that surprise you to hear? No, because it's the same people, the same people that uh, support BMM, the same people that support radical gender theory, and it's the same people. Why they, uh, they do what they do? Because they are indoctrinated with Marxist ideology, and one of the main things of Marxist ideology is identity politics. They put people in two categories. Mao did that in China, too. Oppressors and oppressed. Oppressors bad, oppressed good. And here, same thing. And then you don't have to do anything else. You categorize a group of people, and then your position was taken for you. You don't have to think. Okay, Palestinian oppress, uh, oppressed, uh, Israelis oppressor. And after that, any means necessary, anything justified. The slogan during the Cultural Revolution is rebellion justified. You can do anything to the other side. Killing, raping, kidnapping, torturing, all acceptable because they were the bad people. That's the black and white thinking during the Cultural Revolution that killed millions of people by those red guards. Or just normal people, your neighbor's kids. Here we see the same thing. The first step is accepting violence, justify it and only a short step away from committing it. We are in the moment that those who support Hamas can easily turn into Hamas. 
Yes, and so you, it doesn't surprise you then to see people like uh, the president of China weighing in on this and, and somewhat uh, empathizing with Hamas. Yes, they, yeah. They supposedly are friends with Israel for all these years. And then, you know, I, that's why I tweeted. If you, to, to the people in Israel or to the government, if you think you can make friends with the devil, you should be prepared. And that devil can turn at any moment and stab you in the back. And that's what CCP did. Z Van Fleet has authored a book called Mao's America, A Survivor's Warning. The young people, it really does start in school, does it not, G? If you don't, if, if we're not successful in, in changing the direction of how young people are educated, um, the, the, the country, it, it's very, very hard politically to change a country whose young people are so maleducated, right? That is why, you know, we are in the midst of a cultural revolution. A war has been raged on us, and uh, there's no one to clear war, but we're in the middle of a war. And I always say to win the war, we have to win school. We have to save our kids because they are our future. That's why, that's why I'm so passionate about education, about school choice, about uh, our parents, uh, parental rights. Only when we save our children can we save America. What specifically do you think kids need to know? I mean, if you were talking to young parents right now and maybe they feel a little overwhelmed, what, what do you think really is fundamental that, that you think kids ought to know? Um, you know, maybe what really? middle, middle school, high school, how early? When, when should kids start to learn the fundamental differences between what you're talking about and what America believes in? And from, uh, from very early on, because that's what Mao did from baby. You know, and that's what uh, Biden and administration want to do. You know, start with baby. They want to do uh, a kindergarten. The government, you know, uh, take all the kids as young as babies. Okay. So we have to teach them real history. That is the mission in the uh, school curriculum for decades. They don't know anything about communism. They don't know anything about the horror of communism. That's why they, they think communism is a theory. And that's why when communism landed in front door, no one recognized it. That includes majority of Americans. What about people of faith, G. Van Fleet? What, do, what should people of faith know about living under someone like Mao, if you were a Christian, say, in Mao's China. Yeah, a lot, I know, I, a lot of church took this and that, oh, we're not going to do politics. You know, we're just going to teach the gospel in the church, and we're not going to pay attention to what's uh, going on in the street. And I have a word for that, you know. If they were left, succeeded, all the church would be dismantled. And all the faith uh, organization would be dismantled because... Communism, Marxism is not atheism. It itself is a religion. It's going to uh, destroy all other religions so that it can be the dominant re religion. And it happened in China. It is happening in America. It surely will happen when they took capture power. So you won't have your church. You can just not pay attention to what's going on outside the church, but eventually they're coming after you. Yeah, capitalism and Judeo-Christian values cannot exist under Marxism. It can't. Under com no, no. They cannot coexist. One has to be defeated, and, uh, but what we need to do is defeat communism. Yes. And that's why my, this whole book is about. It's about the parallels and to tell people the history that they never learned. And this is history repeating repeating right in front of our eyes. If only when people realize, you know, if people don't understand what's going on, they don't know what woke is really about, they can't effectively fight against it. So it is communism, I'm telling everybody. It is Marxism, communism. I lived through it 50 years ago, and I'm living through it right now. We have to defeat communism if we want to survive. You know, interestingly, uh, G. Van Fleet again joins us. Mao's America, a survivor's warning. We don't talk a lot about it, but in, in communist China today, 
We know their treatment of Uyghur Muslims. Uh, so I would just say to a lot of, um, it would be a very interesting, if you played this out, if things continue to trend the way they're going, someday one imagines uh, Islamic supremacists versus chi- communist China, right? That It's not, it, th- those two can't exist either, just to be clear. No, they can't. It's going to be crushed. That's why they're going out for the Uyghurs. The Uyghurs are Muslim. And then that's why they go after the Tibetans. They are Buddhists. Yeah. And that's why they go after uh, Christians. And now the, the church is all taken over and they become Chinese church rather than church. Church is in China. That's the real thing is going on is underground church. And that's what communists always do. Wow. They go after people's faith. It's an amazing thing, right? So, you know, it's because th- there is the uh, the, the Islamo fascist movement uh, globally in in places like Iran and in Hamas. I they would meet their match in communist China, would they not? Yeah, yeah. The thing that people ask me that all oh, people commented on that Twitter, you know, um, the thing that they are uh, unholy alliances now because they have a common enemy. Yes, that enemy is the West. And the United States of America. But once that's done, communism can't tolerate Islam, will not tolerate it. That's that's profound. I don't think people nearly talk about that enough. But G. Van Fleet has written a book about it. You should read it because this is someone who's lived it. Brilliant, uh, G. Van Fleet. Mao's America, a survivor's warning. Thank you for your testimony and your continued voice. We're so grateful to you. 20 years in business. Congratulations to Mike Lindell and my pillow. 80 million pillows sold over those 20 years. Can you believe that number? Well, Mike and his team at MyPillow, they want to thank each and every one of you for giving them such success over these many years. And now they want to celebrate by giving you the lowest price in my pillow history. He told me that if you call or log on to MyPillow.com or call them today, you'll get a queen-size MyPillow to celebrate their 20 years in business for just $19.98. 20 years and just about 20 bucks with tax. How about that? $19.98, that's it, for a queen-size MyPillow. Do you know the regular price of this thing is almost $50 more? So you're talking about a $50 discount. By the way, for the king size, you'll get it for just $10 more, $29.98. It's a huge sale, and incidentally, In addition to these pillows that are deeply discounted right now, you go to MyPillow.com and you'll get a discount using my name, Chris Podcast. Use that as your promo promo code, Chris Podcast. Click on the uh, radio listener square and enter that. And you're talking about mattress toppers, pet beds, mattresses, my slippers, sheets, and of course the pillows, so much more. You can try it on. If if, uh, ever you've gone to MyPillow.com and you've thought to yourself, eh, maybe uh, it's a little expensive, Now's the time. Celebrate 20 years with Mike Lindell. And know this, 10-day, or excuse me, 10-year warranty. 10 years they warranty these things. So if they ever wear out or you have trouble, you can exchange for brand new. 60 days they let you take this stuff home, and if you don't like it, you can send it back for a full refund. So you got nothing to lose but a great night's sleep on my pillow products. I have colleagues I've sent these my slippers to. They love them. Christine loves hers. The sheets are comfortable. The towels are super absorbent. Even old Dean loves his dog bed. And we drink my coffee here at the office every day. I just brewed some this morning. MyPillow.com, promo code Chris Podcast. all right? With that warranty fully intact, or call 800-932-5056. 800-932-5056, promo code Chris Podcast, or MyPillow.com, promo code Chris Podcast, if you please to save. DeSantis did like 20 minutes on MSNBC this morning. Like, it was a long sit-down. Is that that working? I mean, what is that doing for him? Because here's the caption under... So so DeSantis is sitting there for 20 minutes with Joe and Mika today, and I just put it up on social media. Here's their caption. DeSantis vows to, quote, slit throats of bureaucrats. (laughs) So that's the thanks he gets? He gives them 20 minutes, and the caption underneath them the whole time is, DeSantis vows to murder bureaucrats. They, of course, know exactly what he means, but I don't know. I don't know. Whatever. Nobody asked me. So uh, Joe Rogan interviewed Elon Musk. Pretty fascinating stuff. Musk talking about George Soros. You wonder, how is all this chaos happening? These, uh, These Larry Krasner prosecutor types 
um, that are letting criminals run amok and turning every major city into Gotham. What's going on here? Elon explains this well. Listen. I mean, Soros actually, you know, it, he, he is, I believe, the top contributor to the Democratic Party. Um, the second one was uh, Sam, Sam Bankman Bank Freed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and Soros, I don't know. I mean, he had a very difficult upbringing. Um, and uh, I, in my opinion, he fundamentally hates humanity. That's my opinion. Really? Yeah. I mean, well, he's doing things that erode the fabric of civilization. You know, uh, getting DAs elected who refuse to prosecute crime. That's part of the problem in San Francisco and L.A. and much other cities. So why would you do that? Was it humanity or is it just the United States as a whole? I mean, is I mean he's doing pushing things places? in other countries, too. He's not doing just the here. same thing? Yeah. Now, George at this point is pretty old. I mean, he's not, uh, you know, he's basically a bit senile at this point. But, I mean, he, he, he and, and he's, he, he's, a, he's very smart. Um, and he's very good at arbitrage. You know, famously, he uh, shorted the British pound. That's sort of how I, uh, I think he made his first uh, money was shorting the pound. Um, so he's, he's good at spotting, uh, basically arbitrage, like spotting value for money that other people don't see. So uh, one of the things he noticed was that in, it, it, that, that the value for money in local races is much higher than it is in national races. So the lowest value for money is a presidential race. Then next lowest value for money is a Senate race, then a Congress, and then, but once you get to sort of city and state district attorneys, um, the value of money is extremely good. And uh, Soros realized that you don't actually need to change the laws, you just need to change how they're enforced. If nobody chooses to enforce the law or the laws are differentially enforced, it's like changing the laws. So there you go. That's well explained. The rate of return for a billionaire, if he's going to invest political money to change outcomes, is to cheaply spend tons of money in local races. You know, federalism allows us to govern ourselves and our cities and our states, uh, ideally at an arm's length from the federal government. And Soros is like, okay, well, if that's the case, then I'll just screw around with their federalism. I'm going to pour a bunch of my left-wing money uh, into races at the local level, and I'm going to cause chaos and disruption at the local level. So these red states will become more disrupted. Um, I mean, it's, it makes total sense, of course. A uh, little bit. We don't have a ton of time here left. Elon Musk talking to Joe Rogan about Twitter and what wasn't fully understood about the control the government had over them. What was that like? Because that, to me, that was the most bizarre. Was the Twitter files when you let Schellenberger yeah. and Matt Taibbi and all those guys get in the Twitter, and the, the response where Matt Taibbi gets audited. I mean, which is just wild. I mean, just just so blatant and so in your face. Yeah, it's weird. No, I, I mean, the degree, yeah, the, the degree to which, and and by, by the way, Jack didn't really know know this, but the degree to which Twitter was simply. Um, an arm of the government was not well understood by the public. And uh, it, it was, there was no, it was whatever the official government, I mean, it was like Pravda, basically. Um, you know, it's a state publication is the way to think of old Twitter. It was a state publication. And was the justification from their perspective that they are progressive liberals, they have the right intentions, it's important that they stay in power, the progressive liberals stay in government and power, because this is, the, this is their... There, there was, there was uh, basically oppression of um, any, any views that would even, I would say, be considered middle of the road. Um, but certainly anything on the, the right, I'm not talking about like like far right, I'm just talking mildly right. The people, like Republicans were suppressed at 10 times the rate of Democrats. Um, now, that's because uh, old Twitter was fundamentally controlled by the far left. It was like completely controlled by the, the, the far left. And later on, Joe Rogan said, look, you spent a ton of money. What do you actually think this thing is worth? What do you actually think it's worth? And he said everything. He says, I'd do it all over again. Did I blow my money? Probably. But I think it's so much bigger and more important than money. I tell you what, isn't it nice to have a billionaire who still values free speech out there? We'll see you tomorrow. 
The Chris DeGall Show Podcast.